Hello everyone, uh, I am Manu Mohini Datta, faculty at the School of Arts and Sciences here at Ahmedabad University and would like to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed speakers and the audience joining us remotely from Ahmedabad, from across India and from different parts of the world. We'll take a moment here to start by introducing our university and the school to the audience. Ahmedabad University offers a liberal education focused on research and interdisciplinary learning. And we strive to make this possible by offering a stimulating world-class academic environment. The School of Arts and Sciences is the youngest of all our schools. And we offer a variety of disciplines ranging from mathematics, physics, life sciences, economics, psychology, social sciences, to the humanities and languages. Uh, on this note, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our very distinguished panel for today, Professor Simon Goldhill, uh, Professor David Schulman, who is yet invisible, but <laughs> will be joining us. No, I, I, we, we, we've identified him. He is with us. He is he's, like, under, okay. he's under a special <laughs> disguise of a name as owner. Okay. <laughs> All right. And our very own Professor uh, Shishir Saxena, who all share our intellectual interest in the study of languages and cultures. Professor uh, Simon Goldhill is Professor of Greek Literature and Culture at the University of Cambridge and is also the Foreign Secretary of the British Academy. Professor Goldhill's research interests lie primarily in Greek tragedy, Greek culture, literary theory, and reception. He has authored numerous books and articles and has been honored internationally with awards in literary studies. I uh, want to quickly mention that among his many, many books, uh, there's one particular one titled, a very interesting title, Who Needs Greek? Uh, and in context of today's talk, Professor Goldhill uh, in that book explores uh, what ancient Greece has meant to Western culture uh, right from the early days till now. He uses an interdisciplinary study of arguments to understand the significance of Greekness in past and contemporary cultures. So we'll be addressing these kinds of things in today's seminar. Uh, and with that, we go on to our next speaker, Professor uh, David Schulman, who reads Greek among the many other languages. Uh, Professor Schulman is Professor Emeritus of Humanistic Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is currently a fellow at the British Academy. Um, Professor Schulman's research interests lie primarily in Indian poetics, live Sanskrit theater, Carnatic classical music, and he is known globally for his work in the study of languages and cultures of Southern India. He has authored and co-authored numerous books and articles and has been honored internationally. In one of his recent books titled Tamil uh, Biography, he studies Tamil, which is not only spoken by millions of people in South Asia, but is one of the few uh, ancient uh, languages that is still spoken. Um, and Professor Schulman in his book, makes extensive use of the early literature, which he shows is crucial to the understanding of ancient culture of Southern India. And in today's seminar, again, we'll be talking about things like this. Um, our last speaker for today is Professor Shishir Saxena, Assistant Professor at the School of Arts and Sciences at Ahmedabad University. Professor Saxena's research interests lie primarily in Indian philosophy specifically the study of Mimamsa, which is one of the six systems of Indian philosophy, and in Sanskrit. He has also worked across the disciplines uh, in his postdoctoral years in Vienna on a project and tools of reasoning for deontic logic and its applications to Indian sacred texts. Within his field, Professor Saxena's most recent work, which was published in an internationally prestigious journal, deals with conflicting prescriptions and prohibitions within this Sanskrit textual tradition and how Mimamsa thinkers actually deal uh, with such contradictions by putting forth hermeneutic solutions. So as you can all see that our speakers are really interested in ancient languages and uh, textual studies, uh, which is what today's seminar is really all about. Uh, how such studies enable us, situated in today's modern world, to understand ways in which the distant past may have lived on in the present.
And without taking any more of your time, I'd like to hand over to our Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, who is also Professor for the Public Understanding of Humanities, an internationally reputed historian and biographer, our very own Professor Patrick French. Thank you very much, uh, Manmohini, for that. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining from so many different parts of the world. Uh, it's wonderful to know that we have people from really sort of all parts of the globe uh, participating. I see there are now over 100 people in the room, but all in different places. Uh, so I really just wanted to, to say um, briefly that the, the, the physical situation of uh, Ahmedabad on the coast of Western India uh, was one of the things that gave rise to the idea of this seminar because of the fact that in earlier centuries, uh, multiple languages or language traditions coming across each other, uh, across the Indian Ocean into other parts of the world would have been part of uh, daily life. And in terms of the sort of historical record, record the archival record in Ahmedabad as a city, there are so many manuscripts in different languages, whether it's uh, Sanskrit or whether it's in uh, Old Dutch or in Arabic or in Persian. And one of the sort of difficulties in the 21st century is that there are so few people who are able to read in multiple earlier uh, languages uh, or, or, or even, you know, going back further, um, ancient languages. And it's really a, a great pleasure to know that uh, alongside my colleague Shashir Saxena, today we have um, Professor David Shulman and Professor Simon Goldhill, both of whom are really at the forefront of this kind of work and exchange and debate, because so many of the things that people globally are trying to develop uh, around global history or global intellectual history, global political uh, theory, uh, so much of that depends on having access to traditions that are less easily accessible. And the more that we can think about ways to put those different academic traditions into dialogue with each other, uh, the better. So uh, that was really all that I wanted to say by way of introduction. I'm more interested in, in hearing the others than hearing myself. So the running order will be uh, Simon Goldhill, David Shulman, Shishir Saxena, uh, then uh, Manmohini Datta will come back in in order to chair the Q&A. And what we thought we might do is begin with questions from one or two colleagues who are in the, the room or the virtual room who work in connected fields in, uh, in other connected languages. So, uh, for example, I know that uh, Dr. Razak Khan from uh, Centre for Modern Indian Studies in Göttingen in Germany is here. Uh, we have Malcolm Keating from Yale, NUS, Singapore, Alex Watson, who's the Professor of Indian Philosophy in Ashoka University. Um, we have a DPhil student at the Oriental Studies Institute in Oxford, uh, Mohini Gupta. So we, we might bring them into the, the Q&A first, but please do feel everybody that you can ask questions, put questions into the chat box as we go along. So um, I'll now hand over to um, Simon Goldhill, and thanks so much for being here today, Simon. Well, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to see everybody here as much as I can. And I only wish I were in India with you, and it's a great pity not to be able to have a cup of tea afterwards and talk about what really happened in the seminar, uh, but that's a product of Zoom. Now, in Cambridge, there's an undergraduate prize called rather wonderfully the John Stuart Rannoch Prize for proficiency in classical languages. And this prize specifies that the classical languages are Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, which is something of an insult to India, and the, not to mention China and Japan. The, uh, the reason why John Stuart of Rannoch set up this prize is not hard to see. He was a devout Anglican. And for him, these are the tria linguae, the three languages of religion. That is to say, the Hebrew Bible, of course, is written in Hebrew, and uh, as are the prophets. The uh, New Testament, so-called, is written in Greek, and it's known in the church for many centuries through the authorized version of Latin um, uh, by Jerome. So for him, it was obvious as a religious man that these would be the three classical languages. 
But as soon as you say that the justification for these, for choosing these three languages is religion, we open an absolute Pandora's box of difficulty. Because Christianity from its very beginning defines itself against Judaism, out of which it emerged, against Greek culture, which it found degenerate, and against Latin culture, which it saw as the dominant uh, language of power. Christianity constantly expresses itself to be a new religion that dismisses those cultures. So how could Christianity dismiss the culture of Judaism, dismiss the culture of Greece and Rome, and yet express itself only through the languages of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin? That's the problem that founds the question of what is the classical. To understand this, we need to take ourselves maybe a step backwards, first of all, to understand something about the history of Greek. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on Greek rather than Latin or Hebrew today, because that's what I'm most interested in, and I think it's the most important. Now, from the 4th century BCE, already there were thoughts that the 5th century BCE was the classical era. It was the great days of Pericles, Aeschylus, and Sophocles, and already in the 4th century they were fantasizing that that was the time to be alive. But what makes it particularly interesting to me is the fact that as we go on through history, Greek language changes, as all languages do. And the very strong, formal, heavily inflected language of, of Greek of the classical period of the fifth century develops on the street, as it were, into so-called koine, which is what the New Testament is written in, what I would call from my elite position, baby Greek. It's not very sophisticated. It lacks various forms and it's very syntactically easy. Comparing Thucydides to, to the Gospel of Mark is like reading um, you know, Chekhov next to a child's essay. So the surprising thing is that as we move on and Koine becomes the language is spoken, across the Roman Empire, those who spoke Greek, which includes all the Ro elite Romans as well as elite Greeks, developed a habit of speaking in the language of the fifth century BC, the so-called uh, so pure Attic Greek. So that the intellectual texts from the second century onwards are written in the language of 700 years earlier. So already there's a gap in what we understand by what is a classical Greek language between the language of Christianity, which was the, originally the koine of the New Testament, and what elite languages really were, what Greek was for the elite of the community. Now that's fine if you think that Christianity is only going to be a language of the poor and a language of the New Testament. But of course, as soon as you start to become the language of empire, as it did from the third century onwards, you have to be able to speak properly. You have to be able to be an intellectual. And we find that the Christians themselves start to develop a whole series of texts in that elite language. So much so that although we call, Christians would call, the language of the Bible the word of God, we start to paraphrase, paraphrase and rewrite the Koine Greek into sophisticated classical Greek. So one of the authors that I've been working on recently in the, from the 5th century CE is Nonus, who came from Panopolis in Egypt. And one of the texts he writes is a paraphrase of the Gospel of John. So he takes the Gospel of John, the word of God, with his most famous five first words, in the beginning was the word. And he writes it into hexameter verse of an elite Homeric style. So he takes us back from the language of ordinary people to the language of the most elite, the most poetical language, and changes it to make it theological. Absolutely fascinating paraphrase. You will know the first words of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word. It begins in the beginning, which is a, a, a version of the beginning of Genesis 2. What's the first word of Nonus's paraphrase? Akronos, timeless, no beginning at all. He takes the action, completely rewrites the gospel to give us a new theologically informed intellectual text. So right from the beginning, in the midst of Christianity, we have rewriting tradition, rewriting language, arguing over what is a classical language. Now, when we get to the Reformation and we get to the Renaissance, we find that this becomes a major battleground which people killed each other over. Erasmus, one of the great intellectual philologists of 
the uh, 16th century, again, goes back to rediscovers Greek. That is what the Renaissance is, the rediscovery of Greek. He reads Jerome's version of the Latin Bible. He worships Jerome, but he also sees that Jerome's language isn't really up to it. So he decides that he's going to retranslate the Bible from the Greek into Latin. And he takes that first word of John, in the beginning was the word, and he says in the beginning was not verbum, but sermo. He translate, retranslates the Greek to try and get the sense of logos. And this opens an absolute storm of violence over what is the tradition of classical language. Is it Jerome's translation of the Bible, which uh, is what all the churches use it? Was it the Greek of the original? Or was it this new translation from the Greek that changes the Latin? It became so heated that many people were put to death over this argument, and the Council of Trent declared that Jerome's translation was authentic. How confused a world you have to live in where a translation becomes authentic rather than the original text. <laughs> but that is the state of play in this period. One of my favorite moments is when a cleric in Britain so upset by Erasmus's apparent threat to the authority of the church, that he actually declared that learning Greek is heresy. What an extraordinary idea, that to learn the language in which your own sacred texts are written could be called a heresy by a, a cleric of that religion. When we see such moments, when you see such moments of apparent craziness, that's when you see ideology at work, when you have to start thinking about what the ideology of that. Now, if we jump forward to the 19th century, when John Stuart of Rannoch set up that prize for Greek, Latin and Hebrew, we find the extraordinary situation that once again, religion has become a huge battlegrounds in the universities of Europe, and particularly in Oxford and Cambridge, where the prize is set up. But at the same time, 80% of the curriculum in elite schools is taken up with the learning of Greek and Latin. So we have once again an extraordinary disjunction whereby, on the one hand, every elite man, and it is largely men, I'm afraid to say, though we, we can talk about women's education too if we, if we come to that, but every elite man is learning Greek and Latin from age six or seven. It becomes part of the furniture of the mind. You translate Shakespeare into Greek, you translate, uh, I don't know, Milton back into Latin and so forth. It's absolutely the way you feel and see the world. You talk in Latin, you swap Latin poems, Greek poems. But at the same time, you're arguing about religion and what the role of that language is in religion and what the truth of religion is. And you could say at the same time, Greek is the perfect language. This is a 19th century claim for its form because it has the right number of tenses, the right number of moods, the right number of, so it's perfect. And all other languages fall short of Greek. Right? At the same time, you're gonna turn English grammar into a model of Greek and Latin grammar. You can only understand English through Greek and Latin in the 19th century. And at the same time as all of that, you're angsting terribly over what is the true word of the original church namely going back to that previous argument that I talked about. Thus we end up with an extraordinary state of affairs, which I think is very important to generalize from to think about what we're talking about. The first thing is this, that when we talk about a tradition, as we do, the tradition of classical languages, tradition is always a rhetoric to make the past seem self-evident. Tradition is always a way of inventing a genealogy for oneself. The classic, to call something classical, is a way of inventing a tradition that gives you a genealogy back to an ideal state. Classics defines the ideal. And that leads you in an ideology of both loss and hope. You've lost the past, which is the classical, and you hope for the future, which will somehow reenact that classical past. And that is one of the great models of romantic 19th century thought. How can we get back to the classics of old? Think of Nietzsche, think of Wagner, think of Marx, 
even think of Freud. The idea that you go back to the past to see where the perfect liberal world was or the perfect state was or the perfect philosopher was, and you come forward to try and reenact that, to re-embed classics. And consequently, the fascination of philology also becomes, as it were, a great cultural movement. The 19th century was the time when philology could claim for itself, quite rightly, to be the queen of sciences. It was the dominant science in the West. Through language, you could discover the truth, the ideal rather, of culture towards which you could aspire. But what that story does is to exactly what I've tried to tell you, that the construction of that model of tradition has to obscure the conflict that is present at every single point in its own history. So for me, what philology, what a new philology has to do is to recognize that double mode. Also always, rec always recognizing the conflict that is the heart of every moment of tradition, but also recognizing the work of tradition as it goes forward, constructing its own models of idealism. We are thinking about what the impact of this has been on us, and I will finish with that. The uh, one way one could do it would just to point out that as John Wisdom said, all Western philosophy is footnotes to Plato. But he could also, he could say, as Derrida says, you, know, you can't do philosophy and not speak Greek. So there's a very interesting way in which we constantly find ourselves speaking Greek without thinking about it. Um, sometimes we think about it. It's a great moment in which Mercury, the Greek actress, was asked to speak in front of the United Nations. And she stood up and said in her very, very heavy accent, she could speak English perfectly, but she put on a heavy accent for this moment. And she said, let me begin by speaking a few words Greek. And you could see all the delegates trying to turn off their translation. They go, oh, God, no. You know? And then she just said, democracy, theatre. <laughs> and so forth, you know, technology, and all the Greek words that we use to express our society. So we can't help but speak Greek in the West. The question is, do we want to understand what that tradition has given us? And can we do it without falling back on the naive conservative model of tradition making history self-evident? I'll stop there. I guess it's my turn. Is that right? And can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, I also want to begin by thanking you for the invitation. I have to tell you before I begin um, that Ahmedabad is one of my favorite places in the world. I've been there many times and I have a particular affinity with Gujarat. Um, some years ago, I, uh, I was in a Tamil temple um, it's a famous place in the um, Tanjore district, Vaidishwaran Koyal, uh, where they specialize in doing what's called Nadi Josyam, where they can tell by a certain complex mode of uh, divination uh, what you or who you were in your previous life. So I decided to try this out. And the uh, astrologer who was um, running through his palm leaf manuscripts in order to perform this divination, uh, he didn't know anything at all about me, and he certainly didn't know that I liked uh, Gujarat, but he told me at the end of the session that in my last life I had been a kind of Gujarati pundit, and that seemed to be actually quite reasonable. Um, maybe because I particularly like uh, Gujarati food, or, well, actually there are many other reasons. Um, I'm going to um, start by offering a kind of um, definition of what I think a classic is. It'll be a little different than what Simon has just told us. Uh, even though I, as you'll see in a moment, I'm also very predisposed to um, advise our students to study Greek. I'll tell you about that. Um, but first I want to begin by just telling you something I learned from experience in teaching. Um, we have at the Hebrew University, I belong to the Hebrew University, uh, we have an honors program for hand-picked um, excellent students small number of students, about 20 or 25 um, every year. And they have a tailor-made BA program 
uh, which in some ways looks to me like it must be very similar to your foundation program at Ahmedabad University. It has these wide ranging courses in all kinds of areas, including natural sciences and of course, humanities and so on. Um, it's a very rich program. I used to teach a course on great books in this course to first year students in this Amirim program. It's called Amirim, which means treetops. So you can see it's um, a kind of um, deliberately elitistic uh, idea of what an education should be. And in particular, a humanistic education. So I used to teach these first year students um, a course in great books and great books for us meant books from everywhere. Um, you know, we would do units, they changed from years to years. I would teach um, Persian Razals and uh, the Arabian Nights and um, various uh, Indian works, of course, and um, sometimes Chinese and Japanese things, which I couldn't read myself. Um, but we would always begin, I taught it with a colleague of mine, we could always begin with Plato's symposium. Or actually, sometimes it was the symposium together with the Phaedrus, which uh, they're kind of twin, um, twin pair of dialogues. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, students who are extraordinarily gifted students, but usually not very well read, most of them were reading the symposium for the first time. And I very quickly discovered that I didn't have to do very much by way of explanation or introducing the text. Um, in fact, the less I said, the better. And really all I had to do was kind of gently and rather indirectly um, try to show these young students that the symposium was actually written for them and about them and about the things that mattered most to them, things like, um, why do people fall in love with one another? And actually, what is love? And all kinds of other things that are already there in one form or another in both the Phaedrus and in the symposium. And I could see that within a week or so, they would be completely immersed in this and very um, fired up by having read this text, you know? So I thought maybe that's a possible definition for me of a classic. A classic work is a book that when, somebody picks it up, in more cases than not, that person will feel that this book was written for him or her and about her or him. Um, and by the way, that also includes books that are not very old. I have to say it's important because we'll be talking later on, I'm sure, about the notion of classics in India and what constitutes a classical language or classical literature. I think the idea of classics as having a kind of privileged antiquity is a colonial product in India. And it's actually distorted um, in many ways the way the tradition has developed here. So I wouldn't look necessarily for antiquity. I'd look for something which speaks very directly in the way that the symposium does. Um, now, however, having said that, I want to say something specifically about Greek and Latin, okay? Although you'll immediately see um, that this has implications for what I will later want to talk about, you know, to speak about Sanskrit or maybe Tamil or something like that. Um, see, there's a question of, um, once you've read something like the symposium, there's the question of how to understand it and what understanding really is. Um, I used to say to my students that there are two ways to begin to have some kind of understanding of the symposium. There's the long way and the short way. So the long way is that you go to the library and you read the symposium in whatever language you know in some translation, or maybe several translations. And after that, you can read all of the secondary literature on the symposium, which in itself constitutes a vast library. And at the end of this, um, there's a chance that you'll understand something of the symposium. But the short way is to learn Greek and to read the symposium in Greek. Uh, but that's not enough. That's not enough. In, um, in my view, this is what my students um, came to call the Shulman principle. You have to read the symposium in Greek, in Greece, in that light and sun, you know, the sun, the air, the smell of the sea, the food, the 
maybe the wine, I don't know. Uh, you have to feel it because I don't believe in disembodied ideas. I believe in embodied ideas, which have a kind of sensual quality to them. And I think that the only way you can achieve that, and I say this from my own experience with various languages, is to actually live inside that language in the place where that language is spoken and to begin to feel the word, the world through that language, because our experience, I think, is very largely, um, let's say, let's call it language specific, or at the very least, you could say it's colored and enriched and deepened by um, things that are not entirely translatable. I say that even though I've spent a large part of my life doing translations, I believe in doing translations, but I do also think that there are um, untranslatable parts, and maybe they're the most important parts of any great, great work. Now, um, let's put aside the Shulman principle for a moment. Um, in the early days of this Amirim program, uh, which was in the early 1990s, um, there were still a lot of active discussions among the faculty as to what the program should actually look like. Uh, and we would have these teachers meetings, people who were involved in teaching. I, I at that time, I was teaching a course on um, linguistics, language. Um, and uh, at one of these meetings, when the question of, you know, how to teach, what to teach, what should the curriculum be, uh, was being discussed. So um, at some point, I said to them, you know, if you want these, these students to actually have a real humanistic education, then I think you should make it mandatory that they all study Greek for at least a couple of years, preferably maybe three or four years. Um, I was, by the way, prepared to compromise on Latin. I had a fallback position, but I, um, I earnestly uh, you know, recommended that they make them study Greek. So I said that knowing that, of course, they were, there was no chance they're going to accept this idea. And indeed, <clears throat> there was an awkward silence it went on for about a minute or two, I don't know. And then one of my colleagues, a really marvelous um, professor of comparative literature, he said suddenly, I only wish that somebody had made me learn Greek when I was 20 years old. You know? So I'm not suggesting that Ahmedabad University require its um, humanities students to study Greek, I'm not. Um, I might be prepared to suggest that you think about making Sanskrit mandatory. We can come back to that in a moment or two, but I just want to say a, a word about why, why I think this is so important. The study of a classical language. It doesn't have to be Greek or Latin, although in the West, um, maybe it should be Greek or Latin. Um, you know, I, I live in Jerusalem, the Hebrew University. It's a kind of Mediterranean culture. We, we, on the one hand, we've inherited the sort of Middle European uh, philological, historical, um, humanistic tradition. We're one of the kind of maybe last remaining bastions of this tradition, along with Cambridge, I hasten to say, and Oxford and a few other places. Um, that means we look west towards Europe, but we also being, you know, placed where we are, poised at this kind of, uh, you know, neuralgic place in the world, um, we also look east to, first of all, the Islamic world. We have a really fine program in Islamic studies, but then also to India and further east to Tibet and to China and Japan and so on. So within that kind of a Mediterranean atmosphere, it makes sense to ask people to learn, not everybody, but really excellent people to learn Greek. You know. But it could be, as far as I'm concerned, it could be Chinese or Arabic or Persian would be a really good choice, or Javanese, not Japanese, old Javanese, actually Japanese too would be good. Uh, a classical language of some sort. So why is that? Why is it so important? I am going to say very simply, um, on the one hand, there's a kind of uh, vertical dimension to this, and there's also a horizontal dimension. Um, the vertical dimension came out very beautifully in what Simon just, just said, so you've actually already heard that. There's a depth, there's an element of depth that comes from studying the foundational texts in the language or languages in which they were written. 
And there's a horizontal element of it in, which, in the sense that I believe that that kind of a foundational text that in, comes with a sort of immense expansion of the, um, how shall I call it, the range of one's thinking. Um, so much so that um, just again, a matter of experience, somebody who's studied Latin or Greek, they go into a library and they take a book off the shelf. Suppose they happen to take a translation of Lucretius, one of my favorite books off this shelf, you know. If they've studied Latin or Greek, it'll mean something different to them even if they can't read it in the original. It'll mean something different. There'll be an entire world of resonance that's available to them. That's the nature of a foundational text, a classical text. That's the nature of a humanistic education. And um, there's also another dimension, which I don't know how to name. There's a kind of third dimension to this um, plea for classical education. Um, it has something to do with the way we experience the world. I think if we were looking for an Indian term for it, I would say there's a particular kind of chamatkara or maybe I'd call it an anirvachaniyatva, some ineffable quality that comes from reading a classical text. Old or new. That's part of the, part of the program. Now, I want to say, um, I still have another two or three minutes. Is that, is that right? Um, um, I don't see Patrick, but I'm going to speak for another two or three minutes and then I'll stop. Um, I just want to say, we could perhaps come back to this in the question and answer period. Um, it seems to me that Ahmedabad University is beautifully poised to put a Sanskrit program, but a serious Sanskrit program into, into place. Maybe it's already there, you can tell me. You have several people working in Sanskrit. Um, so um, Mano Moini and Shishir, and you have also Sam Wright. I mean, you're in a position where actually uh, somebody who had a year or two of Sanskrit would be able to benefit from the tremendous uh, erudition that you already have on site, in place in Ahmedabad University. And um, I just want to say there are different ways one could think about how to do this, how to teach Sanskrit, which after all has its own specificity in the Indian context. It's not the only Indian classical language. Um, actually, as far as I'm concerned, Gujarati is also a classical language. You could read the Akko. I mean, there's a whole literature in Gujarati or in 16th century Hindi. Actually, most of the Indian languages are the major languages. But there is something about the Sanskrit which naturally has a particular specificity that has an immense world of reference and resonance. Um, there are expressive and affective possibilities that exist only in Sanskrit. That's why people chose to write in Sanskrit, among other reasons, for so many centuries, until quite recently. I mean, even now there are people writing in Sanskrit. So, you know, there are different ways in which one could teach this classical language. Um, I don't know how your program is put together, so I can't give you any really pragmatic suggestions, but let me just say, I'll tell you what, I, um, I had an experience some years ago, I was asked to give a talk at the Sanskrit department at uh, Andhra University in Voltaire. So they were very curious to know how we teach Sanskrit in Jerusalem. And I explained to them that the course is set up in such a way that within a year, um, all of the students should be in a position where they can actually read Sanskrit with the help of a dictionary, of course, but they'll have gone through the entire grammar and they'll be relatively independent. They're not going to be dependent upon their gurus or teachers. They'll be able to read any Sanskrit text. It isn't too difficult after about a year or so of intensive Sanskrit. Of course, we always tell our students at the beginning of that year that um, now that they're doing first year Sanskrit, they should know that it's rather demanding. And in fact, I always used to tell them um, if they think they have other things in their life, like for example, uh, their love relationships, other courses, work, I don't know what. Um, they're going to sleep, for example. They're going to have to put all of that aside for the duration of that year because Sanskrit's rather demanding. And they always used to come to me after two or three weeks and say, we thought you were joking with us, but actually you were dead right. It's completely true. But there is a way to give that first year um, um, in a more rapid um, 
uh, intense way. In any case, in, in um, Andrew University, when they heard me give this talk, the audience, the Sans Sanskritists there, some of them very good Sanskritists, they divided into two groups. There was a conservative group which said, this is absolutely crazy. You can't teach people Sanskrit in a year. Um, uh, you have to teach them Panini and grammar by heart. Let them memorize the 4,000 sutras without understanding them. And then slowly over a period of, let us say, five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 years, 12 years is the standard course of time. After 12 years or so, then you can actually begin to teach them how to read things in Sanskrit, you know. Uh, but then there was a young, there was a group of the sort of young radical revolutionaries and they said, you mean you're trying to give these students independence and autonomy so that they can figure things out by themselves and in the, school, in the, in the course of a single year, they thought this was actually a marvelous idea. So I just want to say there are modern methods of teaching Sanskrit now, which would allow, let us say, an intensive summer course of six or eight weeks to give you first year Sanskrit. We have here in Jerusalem a school School of Languages, very successful school of languages outside the university. It's called Polis, Polis, the city. And we have people there, fantastic scholars teaching classical Greek in Greek, in classical Greek, and Arabic in Fusra, that is to say, in standard, um, you know, medieval Arabic, and so on. And they do it, um, they do it very, very well, and it doesn't take 12 years. Um, maybe I'll stop at this, and if you want, we can talk about maybe Tamil and other languages later on. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Schulman. I guess it's my turn. Let me just uh, share my slides before I get started. Well, um, first of all, uh, well, thank you very much for um, Patrick for asking me to speak here today. Um, Professor Goldhill, Professor Schulman are both such uh, distinguished. Uh, distinguished scholars, and uh, uh, it really is a privilege to be speaking alongside them uh, today. Um, now, um, as uh, Manamoini was saying earlier, my own work is in the area of Indian philosophy, and therefore I work on Sanskrit texts and Sanskrit manuscripts. Uh, and it is with uh, that background that I will be approaching this question today about what are the classics. And what I'll try and do is um, try and talk about some criteria which I think are foundational for a work to be considered a classic. Um, and I would contend that the uh, criteria that I will be talking about will in fact be applicable to classics across linguistic traditions and cultures. Now, of course, the examples that I will draw on will be entirely from the Sanskritic tradition because that's, uh, that's the area that I work on. Um, and also because of the fact that uh, well, the examples that I will give, which I will talk about, I honestly find uh, utterly fascinating for a variety of reasons, uh, as I will talk about as we go along. Um, and therefore, in my talk, I'll try and uh, share with you at least somewhat, some of this intellectual joy uh, that even Professor Schulman was just talking about. I mean, some of this joy, which, uh, which seems to be a natural benefit for many of us who are working on uh, classical texts and classical languages. All right, so firstly, what are the classics? I would contend that classics are triumphs of the human intellect. I mean, classics are intellectual masterpieces. Consider, for example, this uh, Sanskrit work from the 16th century, uh, the Ramakrishna Viloma Kavya. Now, for many of the Sanskritists in the audience, perhaps you would all be familiar with this striking and remarkable work. Uh, but the very interesting thing is that you don't really need to be uh, a seasoned Sanskritist or a trained Sanskritist to actually see how how remarkable this work is, what kind of literary genius is required to compose this kind of a work. So here is the opening verse from this work. Uh, it's Tam Bhu Sutta Muktin Udaraha Sambande Yato Bhavya Bhavam Daya Shrihi Shri Yadavam Bhavya Bhato Yadevam Sanghaarda Muktin Uta Sutputam. Now here's the same verse, and all I've done, what I've done is I've just made the uh, individual syllables more apparent. And what you'll see is something quite remarkable. The first line, uh, when read from left to right, tam, pu, suta, muktim, and so on, is in fact the second line read from right to left, tam, pu, suta, muktim, and so on. And similarly, the same thing holds true for the second line. The second line, shri, yadavam, bhavya, and so on, is in fact the first line read from right to left. Now, you might initially think that this is uh, a palindrome, but Recall that uh, a palindrome, in fact, is reads the same whether you read it from left to right or from right to left, and in fact, it has the same semantic content. 
This, on the other hand, is at another level of intellectual difficulty. This, in fact, is an instance of bi-directional poetry. What does this mean? That when you read the line from left to right, which is essentially the first line, you're actually reading the story of Rama. And when you read the second line, which is effectively the same line just read from right to left, you actually end up reading the story of Krishna. I mean, you can imagine, therefore, the kind of literary genius, the kind of um, master poet you need to be to be able to compose a work like this. And in this case, it's not just the, uh, the text itself, which is so interesting. It's also the context uh, in which this work was composed. So, for example, Professor Minkowski, who writes a paper on this particular work, actually uh, argues that this work was composed primarily due to the author's special interest in the Arabo-Persian knowledge systems, specifically in the fact that the uh, Arabic-Persian script, in fact, it reads from right to left. So imagine, if you will, uh, a 16th century Sanskrit intellectual who is so deeply inspired by the Arabic and Persian scripts that he decides to write a Sanskritic work, a Sanskritic poetic work, which can be read not just from left to right, but also from right to left and tells you two completely different stories. Now, I won't really belabor the point uh, by giving you more examples, but, but there are several such instances of literary genius across the, uh, throughout the tradition. And yet, what is really interesting is that for the tradition, these kind of works, although they are much appreciated, they're well known, these in fact are not considered as the real epitome of poetic genius. In fact, for the tradition, real poetic genius in fact lies elsewhere the Mahakavyas, for example. And an appreciation of their aesthetic beauty, of their uh, intellectual rigor, has, in fact, a corresponding uh, requirement even from the reader. So, for example, the Neshada, which is one of the Mahakavyas, is often referred to, I mean, it's often said that Neshada is, in fact, a Vidvat Aushada, um, a tonic for intellectuals. <laughs> and what this means is that um, if you harbor any kind of... Um, false delusions of self-grandeur about your, your own intellect, well, what you should do is you should read the Neshada, and then you will realize really what uh, an intellectual work is. Um, so secondly, I would say that classics also are fantastic repositories of universals of cultural normativity. What do I mean? Uh, the, these kind of works, they, they demonstrate, they clearly lay out, they discuss values which are considered as being universally applicable to all human beings by uh, the text and, of course, also, therefore, the culture. So, for example, uh, within the Indian tradition, there is a lot of uh, discussion about the aims of human life. And all of this varied discussion very often is found couched in terms of the framework of the doctrine of Purusharta. Now, uh, this, of course, isn't the place to really go into any great detail about this doctrine, but very briefly put, according to the doctrine, all human beings, by the very fact of being human beings, seek happiness and seek contentment in life. And that can only come about when one expends effort in four distinct domains of life, four distinct and exhaustive domains of life, namely karma, the pleasurable, artha, material success, dharma, that which is right or good, and moksha, which is liberation from worldly existence. And according to this doctrine, it's only when there is a harmony, only when there is a balance of all of these, that there shall emerge the good life for the individual and for the society. And this you find, in fact, even in a work like the Mahabharata, for example. Uh, now this, uh, I mean, the Mahabharata uses the same doctrine, the same uh, framework of this doctrine to, in fact, proclaim its own scope. So consider this verse, for instance, again, which shows up at the beginning as well as towards the end of the text. Dharmecha arthecha kamecha mokshecha bharata shabha so, in the matters of dharma, artha, karma, and moksha, what is here, that may be elsewhere as well, but what is not here, that is nowhere to be found. So, now, for the Indian tradition, the Mahabharata is a text which has been uh, relevant, the teachings of which have been relevant to human beings ever since it was composed, uh, over two millennia ago, and it will continue to be relevant as long as human beings are around. And therefore, works like the Mahabharata, therefore, help demonstrate these kind of values, these kind of doctrines, which the culture, uh, and of course the text, the culture considers as being universally applicable to the human condition in general, regardless of any kind of individual differences that might exist from individual to individual or even across societies. 
And it's not just these kind of um, universal values which you see in these kind of works. In fact, what, you, what is also interesting is that you see these kind of sentiments, again, something that Aziz Shulman was talking about, these kind of sentiments which I think are, well, for lack of a better phrase, I would say are geographically universal. Consider again, uh, for example, this case of uh, Kalidas's famous poem, The Maker Dutu. Now, when I first came across this, uh, this work, I was really struck by the frame story itself. Uh, the frame story of the Maker Dutu is that it is the lament of an exiled Yaksha. Uh, and he, he speaks out certain things to the cloud when he sees the arrival of the monsoon cloud, when he sees the arrival of the monsoon on the very first day of Ashar, the month of Ashar, which is corresponds roughly to about uh, June or July now. So Ashar has said, Prathama Divase, and so on. And why? Why is he lamenting? Well, because he's separated from his beloved. So, for as the poet says, the heart of even the content becomes emotionally overcome at the sight of rain bearing clouds. So, make aloke bhavati sukhino api anithavriti chetha. How much more than for one who longs for a loving embrace but is impossibly far? Kim punar dura samste. Now, what is really interesting to me is that this sentiment, uh, this emotion, about the monsoons is in fact perhaps instantly recognizable to anybody uh, in India. I mean, anybody who's been in India, in, in, in India for example, uh, who's lived through the, um, the almost ascetic heat of the summer months, knows about the, the respite that the monsoons bring, uh, the cool breeze, the, uh, the almost intoxicating earthy smell of the first rains, the dancing of the peacocks, uh, and all of this. And along with this, this whole gamut uh, of emotions, the blossoming of all of love, all of romance, all of positivity. I mean, I think this is an, uh, this is, this is an emotion which is instantly recognized across India, across this continent, in fact. And yet, this is a sentiment which is found not just in this 1,500-year-old poem, but in fact, it's found even today in across different literary forms, uh, different languages, in film music, in folk music, and so on and so forth. And yet, this uh, emotion, which I think the monsoons probably universally evoke across the subcontinent, I'm not really sure if they will evoke the same kind of sentiments as well. So, for example, in the UK, uh, rains inspire a whole bunch of sentiments, for sure. But whether it's all about the blossoming of love and romance, I'm not so sure about that. All right, and finally, uh, classics. I would also contend are epistemically pluralistic. Again, uh, what I mean is that they help one, they help us broaden our own epistemic boundaries by helping us understand that uh, not just issues, but in fact, entire disciplines can be conceived, can be thought of very differently across cultures, across traditions. So therefore the study of classics can provide specific examples for countering a sort of epistemic unilateralism, which will of course come in if one is steeped only in one approach. Say for example, the Eurocentric approach. Uh, for example, uh, it's quite well known for uh, students and scholars of uh, the Indian intellectual traditions that it's very difficult to translate the words religion and philosophy directly into Sanskritic terms. So for example, religion today in modern India is often translated as dharma. And of course, as we've seen, dharma is not really religion. It is one of the uh, Purusharthas. Uh, dharma has its own very wide semantic range, uh, and similarly also with philosophy. And therefore, a very simplistic conclusion that can be reached is that, well, there's no real religion or philosophy uh, in India. And even if it is, it's, it's a very crude form. Now, this kind of a simplistic conclusion misses entirely the indigenous tradition of Darshan Shastra. And in fact, it's quite instructive, perhaps, to keep remembering from time to time that Buddhism and Jainism, which in fact would be perhaps universally accepted as religions today, have in fact been traditionally referred to as darshanas. So these are both darshanas, just like there are several other darshanas, such as Nyaya, Vedanta, Mimamsa, and so on and so forth. And a darshana, of course, has elements which belong to religion and philosophy, these modern terms, I mean, these terms which would be recognized. Uh, so a darshana has elements from both of this religion and philosophy, and yet with plenty of complexities. For example, uh, a scholar who is perhaps steeped only in a very Eurocentric understanding about religion, for example, it might be very difficult to separate the concept of God from the concept of religion. But when you come into the Buddhist or the Jaina world, you very much do that because both of these are in fact atheistic darshanas, atheistic 
religions. And as far as philosophy is concerned, uh, consider this uh, quote from Professor Torella's work, where he writes that although it is effectively true that there is no Indian equivalent for philosophy, there are, however, thousands of authors and texts that over 25 centuries have asked questions in their own way and in their own context, italics are mine, about the nature of the ego and about epistemology, language, logic, etc. And I think this is really important to understand uh, that cultures have their own way and their own context. So therefore, for example, today scholars who are working on Indian philosophy, uh, when they realize that there are, uh, a culture has its own way and its own context, when they realize this, they also find that they might be working on a text which is, say, 1,200 years old, and yet you might find that you're actually working on fields which are apparently quite contemporary. So you could be working on, for example, on a topic which actually uh, is part of philosophy of mind today, or philosophy of language, or deontic logic, and so on and so forth. And in fact, it's not just at the level of uh, issues and even about um, disciplines. Even at a philological level, there are several, dis several dissimilarities which can be seen. So, for example, modern se sensibilities could dictate that you might expect that philosophy and poetry are, in fact, two different literary styles. So philosophy is written in prose, uh, poetry is, is written in meter. And yet, of course, that's not the case within the Indian tradition. Within the Indian tradition, there are numerous uh, philosophical tomes which are in fact written in verse. Uh, and one could even argue that, in fact, it is this which is the norm and not the exception. And this is, of course, not just the case for philosophy. It's for legal texts, for mathematical texts, and so on and so forth. So in summary, then, what are the classics? I would say at least these three things. A lot more could be said. But one, they are triumphs of the human intellect. These are intellectual masterpieces. Second, these are repositories for, of these universals of cultural normativity. So not only do they demonstrate these kind of values, which a culture considers as being universally applicable across human beings, but also these kind of geographically universal sentiments and emotions. And they're also epistemically pluralistic. They help us broaden our own epistemic boundaries by helping us realize that not just issues, but in fact, entire disciplines, uh, entire uh, texts can be composed, can be conceived of in very different and unique ways. And once again, of course, I've been talking about mainly about, I've been drawing all my examples from the Sanskrit tradition. But again, I would contend that these, in fact, these criteria, in fact, would hold for classics across linguistic traditions, across cultures. All right. Thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, Professor Goldhill, Professor Shulman, uh, Shishir. It was uh, lovely to hear from all of you. And uh, I would now uh, actually open the floor for questions from our audience. And uh, there are some specialists amongst us. And I was wondering if they would like to go and ask any questions they could do so i can invite them to do so professor alex watson is here uh raza khan is here mohini gupta uh, is here so if you want to ask any questions you can just straight away speak into the mic yeah you, you you've been unmuted already i think um i don't mind going first <laughs> Thank you so much for this opportunity, um, everyone. And that was really a brilliant lecture. I'm so glad that I'm, I'm in the UK now and I'm glad that my day has started this way. So thank you so much to all the speakers. It was wonderful. Um, I've been reading recently about linguistic movements across different classical languages. And um, there are a lot of linguistic anthropologists who've studied this phenomenon where, um, you know, um, even if two languages don't belong to the same family, sometimes linguistic traits get diffused over contiguous areas. And that specifically is true for Sanskrit and Tamil, um, you know, even though they belong to different families. And um, I was wondering what happens when one or the other classical language that exists next to each other start getting seen um, as dominant. For example, the, you know, the de-Sanskritization of Tamil that happened a few hundred years ago. And how does that, how do these sort of linguistic movements start um, affecting, you know, the historical uh, position of these languages or, you know, how, how do you see these movements? So it, it sounds as if I'm meant to answer that question. Is that right? Yeah. I found it a little hard to hear. Yes, if you would. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me say the following. Um, 
you know, uh, it's certainly the case that um, if you read Sanskrit as a kind of truly Indo-European language and um, think of it in terms of Greek and Latin and uh, Icelandic and uh, so on, um, that's one way of reading Sanskrit. But um, if you think of, uh, especially, uh, let's call it um, first millennium, second millennium Sanskrit from the Gupta period onwards, um, it's a problem to read Sanskrit as if it were a kind of um, classical Latin or Greek. It's really not, not, not really right. It's an Indian language which shares um, a whole range of features with um, the uh, spoken languages of India, both North India and South India, Tamil no less than uh, Gujarati. Um, there's been work done by linguists on this. Um, people talk about India as a linguistic area. So especially in syntax, for example, in um, classical, let's say in Vedic Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit is a right branching language. That means that uh, mod modifiers tend to follow um, after um, their head noun or whatever it might be. If I say uh, the bridge that I crossed on my way into the city, so there's the bridge and then I crossed and so on. That's called right branching in a kind of arbitrary way. It's based obviously on languages that are read from left to right, which is an arbitrary thing. But um, actually almost all Indian languages are left branching. And if I were to translate the um, way of, you know, that kind of a sentence into uh, medieval period Sanskrit or into Tamil or Telugu or Malayalam, it would be the into the city leading bridge. It's left branching. All the modifiers, nearly all the modifiers uh, precede uh, the modified. Um, and in fact, if, if, as one develops a kind of sensitivity to especially the things like uh, aspect and modality uh, in medieval Sanskrit, although it's not something which is very well represented among Sanskritists, you immediately see that it's got the same rich uh, modality and uh, aspectual um, features that we find in Hindi or in Tamil, actually any of the major languages. Now, I, I do want to say, however, if you're going to juxtapose Tamil and Sanskrit, um, these are deep waters because of the political or political, we might say the politicization of this language question in the Tamil South. It's also spread by now into um, Kerala and to Andhra to a lesser extent in Karnataka. It's as if the Dravidian languages, uh, they are a family of languages, bears no um, genealogical uh, relation whatsoever to the Indo-European languages, that is say Sanskrit and the North Indian um, medieval and modern languages. But um, uh, if you juxtapose these two groups as two uh, kind of, um, um, how shall we say, isolated uh, entities, and then even worse, begin to develop a political mythology in which the Northern languages somehow are felt to have invaded and then uh, appropriated or expropriated the uh, um, resources of the South. If you do that, you end up with a very distorted view of uh, Indian linguistic and cultural history. Actually, to think of Sanskrit and Tamil as an opposition, uh, although there are there is some evidence to that effect from time to time in the tradition, but to think of it like that is to uh, is to distort the um, historical and cultural reality of Tamil and Sanskrit, which were always complementary, as um, as is the case in nearly all of the Indian languages. So I would recommend that one try to avoid the trap of the sort of nationalist uh, Dravidianist ideology when it comes to a question of what languages to learn and how to understand that. Um, as one last uh, note, I, I also think in terms of Sanskrit, it's perhaps a good idea for people who want to learn Sanskrit or are working in Sanskrit to try to disentangle the notion of Sanskrit from that whole world of, um, let's call it privilege and power, which of course was there it's not something which is um, just simply invented, but it offers a very, very narrow view of what Sanskrit actually was. And to focus only on that, on the relation of Sanskrit to privilege, social privilege and economic privilege and so on, to do that is um, to skew the historical picture in a very radical way. I would recommend trying to put such ideas aside. Could I offer a brief different sort of answer. Um, we're very used to thinking, as David indicated, about language in relation to colonialism and nationalism. 
with the idea that the dominant authority naturally tries to impose its language on the other, and there is a resistance which turns can turn into nationalist language. It's very well worth remembering that the mother of all empires is the Roman Empire. And Rome, when it conquered Greece, was conquered by Greek language and culture in return, to the extent that most elite Romans spoke Greek. We should always remember that when Julius Caesar was killed, he did not say et tu brute, as Shakespeare would have it. He said kaisu technon, you too, child, in Greek. <laughs> well, the moment of his death, he actually spoke Greek rather than Latin. You know, that's what came out naturally from him. It was so embedded in him as a language, even though he wrote Latin. And so one should remember that it is not inevitable which way power goes. It's not inevitable which way language control can, can, can happen. And that culturally and socially, there can be a really interesting dynamic and mix. And if we forget about that, we're, pay, we're actually rather complicit with a naive version of how authority works. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schulman, Professor Goldil. Uh, I think uh, Professor Alex Watson has a question, after which we go to uh, Razak Khan, and he has a question too. So, uh, Professor Watson, if you could go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Um, yeah, I actually just wanted to read out a brief paragraph um, written by Schopenhauer, um, for its relevance to this question that has emerged intermittently of why study a classical language and its literature. Um, so what he wrote was, there is for the mind no greater relaxation than reading the ancient classics. As soon as we have taken up any one of them, even for half an hour, we at once feel revived, relieved, purified, elevated, and strengthened, as if we had enjoyed drinking at a fresh rock spring. Is this due to the ancient languages and their perfection, or to the greatness of the minds whose works remain unimpaired and unaffected after thousands of years? Perhaps it is the effect of both. But this I do know, namely that if, as is now threatened, men were to give up learning the ancient languages, then a new literature would appear consisting of barbarous, shallow and worthless writings such as had never previously existed. Um, so I guess one question to everyone is if that um, inspires any thoughts in you, has any resonance with you. And in particular, um, there's a kind of argument, implicit argument there and in other things that Schopenhauer wrote, a kind of argument from quality for why we should bother studying classical languages. And his idea was that the majority of what's written in any era is written just for that era, will not really live on. Um, and we, one could perhaps use a kind of food metaphor here, not that he does, but one could perhaps say that, you know, this, this literature that he regards as just ephemeral, that will be dead five years after it's been written, is rather like sort of sweets, candy, mitai, um, not so nourishing, only good for short-term nourishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of one's intellectual diet, um, the classics offer something more, more nourishing, more deeply and long-lastingly nourishing. So do you, um, do any of you agree with that kind of argument from quality or do you think that's going too far? It's a very difficult argument to make when your languages have been used often as a defense of political oppression and dominance of a particular <laughs> class. <laughs> so there's an embarrassment that comes with it. It doesn't mean I don't think that the ancient Greek classics are particularly wonderful, I do. And <laughs> I wish all my students would feel exactly as Schopenhauer does whenever they have half an hour to read the work I give them to read. Um, one thing one might say uh, to David and to you, in particular, is that when compulsory Greek, which used to be part of the university system in England for Oxford and Cambridge, was removed by vote in Oxford, the professor of Greek, Gilbert Murray, voted in favor of the removal of compulsory Greek yeah. on the grounds that he could not imagine a time in which educated and civilized people would not want to know Greek. 
So <laughs> I think it's a very interesting moment that for various reasons, since the 1980s in particular, there has been a general embarrassment in academia about talking and thinking about quality. Hmm. People say, oh, you shouldn't offer value judgments as if you could do any business in academia without value judgments. <laughs> You're making them all the time, not least by what you choose to study. So it seems to me that we need to have a more sensitive version. It wouldn't take more than five minutes of reading further in Schopenhauer to realize there is quite a lot of the ideology of Schopenhauer to which I suspect not even you, Alex, would wish to sign up. <laughs> there is, that's to say, his commitment to Philhellenism and his various forms of German Reinheit are things that I would you know, not want to agree with and would recognize his support of Hellenism as part of that. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean one should issue all ju value judgments. So I look forward to a day when we can have some slightly more sophisticated versions of why we care about what we care about and why quality should be part of that. Mm. And we should not be embarrassed of using such terms for our students, but we should be cautious and we should be sophisticated in that language. Um. So I'd like to say something about um, what Schopenhauer said. <clears throat> Maybe first I should say that it seems that Murray was wrong in his assumption. As he was about many things. <laughs> yeah. He also found um, the patients. <laughs> you know, um, uh, this is Gilbert Murray, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he says in his autobiography, he recalls an incident where, as a young boy in grammar school, he was sent to the headmaster's office for some minor offense. And he was so um, terrified by this that he completely forgot how to speak Greek and he was reduced to speaking to the headmaster in Latin. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I call a classical education. And it's a kind of a worthy goal in a way. Yeah. But as far as the Schopenhauer quote goes, I, I know in a way what Schopenhauer um, was feeling. I mean, I can identify that, although there are parts of it that I don't agree with. That is, I don't think that studying classical Greek or Latin or classical Sanskrit or classical Tamil is an experience of purification. I don't think so. I think it might be therapeutic. My own students often tell me that studying first year Sanskrit has a therapeutic effect. I can believe that. <laughs> And I know the feeling that I was trying to get at before when I talked about that particular kind of wonder, Jamatkara, that does come from reading, let's say, Homer in, in the original or something like that. But you have to remember that these are idealized images and they can do a lot of damage. So for example, if you were to open any history of classical Sanskrit literature written in the course of the 19th century and the early 20th century by people who knew Sanskrit well, all of them, I don't want to list their names now, all of them um, were people, of course, who knew Greek and Latin, and they're constantly judging Sanskrit literary production negatively by comparison with Greek and Latin. And sometimes they say there is nothing in Sanskrit that could even remotely compare to the chaste beauties of the classical Greek and Latin languages and so on. And that's because, well, I mean, because it's a, one of those things, I don't know if I can actually give the full causal explanation, but part of it lies in the fact that they were unable to truly fathom the sensibility that uh, lies behind the kind of um, verses that Shisha was, uh, was showing us. For example, that Viloma verse at the very beginning, it takes a particular kind of um, openness and sensitivity to be able to feel what a poet like Surya Dasa was, was trying to do. And they didn't have it. Sometimes I think it's because they were, um, they were filled with a kind of anxiety at the immense richness and polyphony of, um, of the kind of things that one finds in Sanskrit Kavya, and they didn't know what to do with it. So, you know, these idealized visions of the classical ideal um, I think they are often a rather blunt weapon that can do a lot of damage. Perhaps if I could just briefly chime in as well. Please, Shishit, please. I mean, yeah, I mean, about uh, finding uh, 
I'll tell you a little bit from my experience. I'm uh, talking about reading these kind of classical languages and finding them refreshing. Um, I mean, my own experience, I mean, I would probably, uh, you know, uh, resonate more with Professor Schulman's students when, you know, they say that the first year of Sanskrit just takes it all from you. I mean, and for forever, I mean, even this this verse, this Viloma Kabi work, for example, I mean, I can marvel at it in terms of its intellectual uh, rigor, in terms of its intellectual brilliance. I mean, I can really marvel at that. But, uh, or even, for example, the uh, the work from Meghaduta, you know, this kind of sentiment about the rains, you know, I can really marvel at this. I can really, this really appeals to me. But uh, whether I really catch the poetic beauty itself, I'm not really so sure because, I mean, it's still so much uh, cerebral uh, stuff. I mean, there's so much work which needs to go into actually trying to understand a Sanskrit work. But again, is there uh, no reason to read these? I mean, as I was saying, I mean, these are, these are really brilliant works. I mean, that you can see. Uh, there's a lot of this epistemic uh, plurality, which also you can see. I mean, this quality thing, for example, I mean, Alex, in your own work, I mean, uh, within the world of uh, Darshan Shastra, within the world of Indian philosophy, I mean, you have these really sophisticated, very intricate arguments about the nature of consciousness, about uh, the nature of the mind, uh, philosophy of language. I mean, I was also mentioning the ontic logic. I mean, a whole bunch of areas which are completely unexplored. And I think that what, that is something that really makes uh, the study of Sanskrit Definitely. Very, very interesting to me. I would definitely add that. Thank you. Thank you, Shishit. No, I, I think it's basically what classics are, as I understand from all of you, uh, with a little bit of my own understanding, is the appeal to uh, universality. At the same time, something which uh, Professor Schulman said, which is, uh, I think, very crucial, the part which is untranslatable, in any language which possibly is the key to the uniqueness of understanding culture through that particular language. But at the same time, the universal appeal as Professor Goldhill was mentioning, when you, when you read it, you feel, or Professor Schulman was possibly saying this, that you feel it's written for you. Uh, there is some kind of connect you feel with that. So uh, with that, I will go on to uh, inviting Razak Khan if he wanted to ask something, I'm told. Uh, uh, so you, I think you seem to, it looks like your, your mic is on, but we, we're not hearing you. Uh, okay. Should we just move on, Patrick? Um, yeah, I can see Razak is talking, but I'm not hearing. Uh, it's muted on my screen. Ah, ask to unmute. Yeah, so you're actually, your, your mic is open, but there's a, a disconnect. Um, I think, Manu, Manu Mohini, do you want to move on and then yeah. maybe we can come Yeah, back? When, when, when he can... Uh, uh, be good if Razak left the room and came back. That would be the best thing to do if someone can let him back in, because that's the best way of reconnecting. I think. Oh, okay, good idea. Okay, try that. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions that has been uh, coming in various forms from our audience is uh, the issue of uh, classical languages uh, being studied in modern universities and uh, how much dialogue can be there, if at all, uh, within these various forms of languages across the world. Uh, so would any of the panelists like to respond to this broad question? Professor Schulman, you spoke a lot about uh, teaching classical languages in uh, universities. Uh, would you like to go first? I'm not sure I understood the question precisely. Do you want to? The, the, the question is basically uh, how relevant is the study of classical languages? Um, though you have addressed it in your talk, uh, in a modern university, should it be made compulsory at all? Uh, that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is there are several classical languages across the world and in a diverse country as India. So can they be in dialogue with each other? Okay. Um, you know, I don't know that I can speak to what should happen in all the universities of India. <laughs> but if we think about Ahmedabad University, which has a, 
a commitment to what it calls, you know, liberal, uh, universal, um, interdisciplinary, humanistic values. I I think there is room for um, giving some priority to Sanskrit. Um, I don't know about making it mandatory. That's um, I wouldn't even dare to begin to think like that. But in terms of uh, making it attractive. Um, and um, connecting it to the kinds of intellectual resources that you already have and that are clearly already a part of your program, that I think uh, would make a lot of sense. And Sanskrit makes sense in a place like Ahmedabad because, um, you know, I, after all, I mean, it's wonderful to learn Greek and Latin and old Javanese, but um, Sanskrit is there. And um, in a certain sense, also Sanskrit is an endangered language in the sense that the tradition itself is continually um, kind of thinning out as uh, older people die and the recruitment of uh, new young Sanskritists, although it still exists, uh, the numbers are not very high. And that means that a truly precious part of the cultural heritage is um, on the, you know, it's in a kind of uh, state of um, being an endangered species. So I, I would highly recommend some form of Sanskrit education, at least to the point where a student after a couple of years would be able to be familiar. So it wouldn't be foreign to him. He heard a Sanskrit shloka or picked up a Sanskrit book or even a Hindi version of a Sanskrit book, but had some access to the original. It would not be a foreign territory and preferably also would not be stained by the kind of ideological prejudices, which are kind of very accessible and floating around. As to other classical languages, you know, um, Tamil, Tamil is a good choice, but it's a long ways from Ahmedabad. Um, I don't know if you've even considered uh, offering a South Indian language in the program. Wouldn't have to be Tamil. It could just as well be Telugu or Malayalam or Kannada. Mm. Doesn't matter. But a South Indian language, you know, as a kind of elective, perhaps, um, even if it were only a, a year or even less than a year, that might be a very refreshing, refreshing thing. I think that to, to break down the barriers between these um, kind of northern and southern ideologues is a good thing. So I would recommend that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, and expanding our uh, yeah. breathless languages and uh, we're, yeah. of course, very open to that. Uh, Can I just add, yeah. perhaps, here, oh, okay. Manamoni? Yes, yes, please. If you don't mind me. So just to add to what Professor Shulman was saying, and just to briefly also tell you, Professor Shulman, about the way we're teaching uh, Sanskrit at our university. I mean, one of the things that uh, that is the case, I mean, of course, you would know, uh, I mean, in India, um, Studying Sanskrit is, of course, not the most desirable program to try and uh, get into. You, know, you really want, I mean, if you're an intelligent kid, you should be doing economics or computer science. Perhaps these are trends across the world, but certainly in India, uh, which is an extremely ambitious country, there's a lot of things which are going on. And today, I mean, very recently, I mean, there are, in fact, Delhi University cutoffs which are coming. I mean, we often end up taking a look at them. And in fact, you can see the cutoffs. So you look at all of these top colleges and for, uh, for all of the subjects, for economics, for, um, for philosophy, for any of the subjects, there'll be 99, 100%. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But if you look at uh, uh, a BA Sanskrit, it will be at 75, 72. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, there's a huge difference. And that's the reality uh, in India and in Indian universities. That's for sure. But what I would certainly like to add is, is that what is really interesting here at Ahmedabad uh, and I'm, in fact, currently teaching the uh, first year of Sanskrit, uh, the first course, in fact. What is really interesting is that at Ahmedabad, uh, this course is, in fact, open to everybody, to students across the university. So you don't necessarily need to be doing a BA in Sanskrit, for example. I mean, there's nothing of the sort. I mean, you could be doing computer science and yet you could be studying uh, Sanskrit. I mean, you could be part of the course, which, in fact, is really quite interesting. I mean, there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, response as far as the, you know, the Sanskrit class is concerned. And I'm very happy to say that many of my students, in fact, come from... Uh, many different fields uh, from uh, from within the university, and and it's just because of that because there is an interest in the language. You know, as you were saying, I mean, there's a very uh, there's a very deep connect. I mean, there are all of these values which we recognize. There's all of these. We end up. I mean, in India, you end up growing up with so much Sanskrit around you, so there is a certain amount of recognition. And 
that at least is one thing that we're doing, we're trying to do at the university where, you know, you're really opening it up to everybody. And there are people from across the uh, university who are in fact uh, coming in. So that's at least one thing that I want to add. I mean, I really look forward to perhaps talking to you more about this topic about, you know, how to teach uh, this language at the university. I mean, this would be wonderful even outside of this webinar. Can I ask you how many students oh. you have in first year Sanskrit? Oh, uh, in fact, the, the current class that I have, we're almost touching, I think it's 40. I think it's almost about 40 or so. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Could, I, could I make two very general points quickly on this? The first is, about, this is, the first is about relevance. Uh, uh, it's a great mistake to think that what is relevant is what is like you. Now, 90 percent of PhDs or nearly 90 percent of PhDs in the humanities in America are on contemporary subjects. It's a very, very frightening thought. Mm. Right? You open the imagination, you open your mind by studying what is not like you, not what is like mm -hmm. you. Okay, that's a really crucial thing about relevance. The second point is about the past. Cicero said very wisely, if you, if you don't know where you come from, you're destined to spend your life as a child. And the naivety of thinking that you can have some understanding of the present without understanding your relation to the past and understanding that past seriously, you're very, very naive. So for me, the idea that what relevance is, is, oh, we must do modern things that are like us, is an absolute failure of educational process and principle and should not be allowed. So I wouldn't make subjects, as it were, compulsory. I would make smart thinking compulsory. <laughs> and to make smart thinking compulsory, you have to have some understanding of the past and of people who are not like you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll have to uh, take the last question. Uh, I know there are many other questions we will be able to address everything in the interest of time, but we will take the question from Razak Khan. Um, so I'll tell you what we might do while we, while we wait for it, is I might just say a few uh, final uh, comments before handing back to uh, you, um, Manmohini. Um, so I, I really wanted to, to, you know, very much thank everybody for being here and to say that, uh, as Shishia alluded to, we have uh, Sanskrit running, we also have other languages, um, Urdu, Persian. Uh, we will, I think, have Kannada uh, quite soon through a colleague who uh, is in the process of joining. Um, We've got sort of more obvious languages, if you like, like French and Spanish, but we're, we're very keen to try and get them into dialogue as much as possible. But the thing that to me it sort of remains unsolved is the fact that so many people who work in these different languages internationally, whether they're in classics departments or in area studies or in Indology or Arabic or whatever it is, uh, it seems to me that so many people want to put languages back into dialogue with each other, particularly things like, let's say, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, uh, Sanskrit, uh, Arabic. And I don't know if we've yet really sort of figured out how to make that happen, given the level of academic and intellectual curiosity that seems to be in different universities globally right now. Mm. But if we can, we can help that at all at Amdabad, then we, we will. So let me um, pass back to you, um, Manmohini, and thank uh, everybody again for, for being here today. Sure. So, uh, Patrick, uh, I think uh, I have uh, the question from uh, Razak Khan uh, okay. and okay. <laughs> the chat box. And I, I'm just going to read it out. So he uh, writes, quote, uh, I wanted to bring the question of translation of classics, particularly from Greek and Sanskrit through Arabic, both in the West and in India, unquote. Mm. I would say straightforwardly that the classics come to us mediated. One of the reasons why Schopenhauer's Reinheit is to be feared, like all forms of Reinheit, is that it ignores that mediation. And yeah. so uh, for me, it's absolutely crucial that, that long, the way we understand the constructedness of tradition is to understand the constructedness of those classical texts. Um, much as we'd love to be able to just read a classical text, nobody can do that. We always approach them through our masters and through previous readings and through our friends and all the rest. And through Arabic is one of those major transitional routes. So, um, you know, we have to add classical Arabic into <laughs> the classical languages for sure. Um, I mean, it's making what a scholar looks like a very frightening prospect at the moment, but hey, it always was.
don't know if you agree with that, David. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just like to say that the, um, the massive um, project of translating Greek thought into Arabic uh, might be compared with the translation of Sanskrit texts into Tibetan, um, which again was an enormous project that went on for several centuries. And uh, the result of it was that many texts that have actually disappeared altogether in the Sanskrit original survived only in Tibetan and in forms which sometimes allow us to reconstruct the original Sanskrit. And like that, there are other places in the world where you had major translation projects. And of course, mm -hmm. something like that is, um, that's built into the very nature of the kind of um, um, things that we do when we talk about a classical tradition, really any classical tradition. Thank you. Uh, Shishu, did you want to come in? Or? I, yeah, I mean, I think Professor Colehill, Professor Shulman have pretty much covered it. I mean, I, I could perhaps just add slightly is that within the Sanskritic tradition, there's also this slight complication of uh, works like, for example, which uh, say the Sarvadarshana Sangraha, where in fact the author quotes from multiple works because he's compiling, a, he's making a compendium of different doctrines. And in fact, there's a very recent, very interesting uh, paper by Professor Bronkhorst um, in the Journal of Indian Philosophy, in fact, on translating the Sarvadarshana Sangraha, where you find that the person is in fact quoting from other uh, texts, but in fact is paraphrasing the text itself. So very often with the same person, is, I mean, apparently he's referring to another text, but the idea could actually be different and how you know interrelated even this within one tradition itself how uh, how quotations need to be considered especially when you're translating and how this how this becomes very difficult for a translator so even things like yes from sanskrit to tibetan and so on and yes even within uh, individual traditions i think it can be quite a diff quite a nightmare even for translation yes uh, translation <laughs> And, uh, but yes, uh, regarding the Tibetan thing, uh, but Patrick informs me here that we had hoped for Dr. Uh, Bridget Kellner to join us, but it was unable to. Um, yeah. So with, with that, we have just exceeded our time limit. Um, and uh, I would now like to wrap up the uh, session by saying, that it was very, very enlightening for all of us. I can see many of our students are here who are studying history and Sanskrit and uh, culture. So it, uh, it's of tremendous, uh, the seminar has been of tremendous use to them, I'm sure. And on behalf of everybody here at Ahmedabad, we would like to thank you all for taking the time today to be with us from different time zones and uh, to talk about timelessness in a certain way, to talk about classics in the modern world, to the understanding of humanity. And I apologize to many of our audience whose questions we could not take uh, in the interest of time. Um, we hope to have a seminar like this in the future and do hope you join us with all your questions and hope to have the conversation going. Over to you, uh, Patrick. Okay, that's over and out from me, and a big thank you to everybody for joining this afternoon, this morning, this evening, depending on where you are.